Hello and welcome to VOS Red Carpet. My name is Jackson Bungani. Thank you so much for joining us today. On this episode of Red Carpet, we have South Africa's first balloon pilot, an artisanal chocolatier in Ivory Coast, and Africa's first winner of the Nobel Prize of Architecture receives a hero's welcome in his hometown. Let's get on with the show. And let's begin the show with some highlights of the latest entertainment news from around the world. In some box office news, Jurassic World Dominion stomped to the top of the box office charts, scoring a massive $143 million in its domestic box office debut. Despite blistering reviews, the sixth film in the Universal's Dinosaur Saga is looming large over a sizzling weekend at the domestic box office. It's only the third time in the pandemic era that the ticket sales have collectively eclipsed the $200 million mark, according to Comscore. That's also thanks to the enduring popularity of Top Gun Maverick, which is still flying high in the second place. Even with the near-deafening roar of Jurassic World, Tom Cruise's beloved blockbuster Top Gun Maverick stayed strong, adding $50 million from the 4,262 North American cinemas in its third weekend in theaters. And now to some music news. Canadian pop singer Justin Bieber is showing early signs of making a recovery after he was diagnosed with a virus that left half of his face polarized, according to a surgeon who specializes in facial polarisis. In a video posted on Instagram, Bieber said that he had contracted Ramsey Hunt syndrome, which affected nerves in his ear and face. He noted that his right eye was not blinking. Charles Nduka, a consultant, plastic reconstructive surgeon in Britain, and the co-founder of the health charity Facial Palsy UK, say that about 75% of patients with the syndrome who receive early treatment, including steroids and antivirals, make a full recovery. Biba said that he was physically unable to perform his upcoming shows. And let's go to West Africa in Burkina Faso, where world-renowned architect Debedo Francis Kerry returned to his hometown in Burkina Faso at the weekend for the first time since winning the Pritza Architecture Prize, his profession's most prestigious award. Here is more. That was the welcome received by Debedo Francis Kerry in Burkina Faso at the weekend. If you don't know who that is, well, he's not a trophy-winning athlete or beloved movie star. He's an architect. And what's more, he's the first African and black winner of the Pritza Architecture Prize, the profession's most prestigious award. I have a feeling of great gratitude and satisfaction as well from seeing that all the efforts that we have produced together, the work that we did together, is recognized and that the people are proud of it and realize that we did a good job. Kerry returned to his hometown to a hero's welcome. Gando had no school when he was growing up there. The son of a village chief, he left at a young age to attend school in a nearby town, the first in his community to receive an education. Back where it all began on Saturday, he visited two schools that he designed they use shed and thick walls to combat the region's crippling heat. I build massive walls. A lot speak a thermal mass, but what happens is I build a ceiling on top and I create openings. Then I build a large roof like a treetop, and that roof protects the building against the weather mostly rainwater that could destroy the fragile soil walls. It also protects the walls against heat. As the first African to win the prize, he says he feels a responsibility that makes him think of the future. The challenges he sees include the climate and violent conflicts over remaining resources. The challenges also come from the growing population, cities that are growing, how to find solutions to create infrastructures. Kerr splits his time between Burkina Faso and Germany, where he studied and established his practice. 
He has designed schools, health facilities, and public spaces across Africa, Europe, and the United States. You're watching Red Carpet on The Voice of America. Now, although the war in Ukraine has entered its fourth month, local artists have not stopped working. For many Ukrainians, art during the wartime is a powerful tool that helps people stay strong and inspired. Omelian Oshdoliak has the story. The rehearsal is over. Now the curtains can open. Artist Vitaly Rupelt is creating a graphic poster right here in his cramped Lviv apartment. Art is a weapon, believes Rupelt, who is following in the footsteps of his favorite graphic designer, Ukrainian insurgent army artist Nil Hasevich, who died in 1952. History repeats itself. The liberation struggle of the 40s and 50s, and now it's happening again. On day three of the invasion, I got involved and remembered who I am. Rupelt's military scene posters are distributed around the world with the help of Lana Mitsko, director of the Lviv Municipal Art Center. These posters are being sent to other cities, sometimes along with humanitarian aid, sometimes with the journalists traveling from Lviv further on. We usually provide them with samples. This is reactionary art. British art curator Vanessa Branson arrived in Lviv after visiting Bucha and Hostomel, founder of the Marrakesh Biennale and sister of billionaire Richard Branson. She seeks to see something else in this war, a new beginning and flourishing among the ruins. The invasion has been very focused on destroying cultural um, museums and churches and any cultural object that, that makes a Ukrainian feel Ukrainian rather than Russian. And on the one hand, you've got this destructive force coming in, just destroying everything. And on the other hand, as a sort of defense, you've got people making, creating, never before as culture felt more vital and actually exciting. These are fragments of a Russian missile that hit Lviv. Volunteers and artists painted the missile remnants and put them up for auction to raise money for the Ukrainian army's needs. It's not just some deformed piece of metal. You know that this is an aggressor's missile. It was really scary to touch it. I wanted to get an idea through, to cover all this evil, so to speak. I painted our jet fighter on it, a MiG-29 flying in that direction, tearing barbed wire that I painted in Russian tricolor. But even as these artists keep Ukrainian culture alive in art, Ukraine's Ministry of Culture has reported that Russian forces have destroyed or damaged more than 30 museums and reserves, 116 architectural monuments, and more than 130 churches. Omaliano Shudlak for VOA News, Lviv, Ukraine. And let's go back to West Africa in Ivory Coast, where an artisanal chocolatier blends good flavor and good intentions in his work. Axel Emmanuel Badu trains women to get good taste and good profits from the cocoa beans they process, as Yassin Siao observes in this report, narrated by Carol Gonsberg. The chocolatier Ivorian's handcrafted bars are prized, especially after last March, when the brand was judged best chocolate in the world at the Paris International Agricultural Show. Maybe that's not surprising. Ivory Coast is the world's top producer of cocoa beans, the key ingredient. Each bar is hand-wrapped in paper mimicking African fabric design. Bonjour, 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 les mamans. Chocolatier Axel Emmanuel Bao starts with organic or fair trade cocoa beans. 
He traveled one recent day from his base in coastal Abidjan to the south central Ivory Coast town of Tumodi to buy a few kilos. It is pure cocoa, which smells very good and can make good quality chocolate. Hand processing increases the value of these beans. That can add value to the women's daily lives. The women select, shell and roast the cocoa beans, handling more than half of the transformation from cocoa to chocolate. By doing all this work themselves, they can sometimes quadruple the value of the raw bean. Most of Ivory Coast cocoa is exported in raw form. Since we started this job, things have improved. We work daily. It gives us income that helps us take care of our children, our husbands. Valentin Yao is a manager with Co-op Bell Cooperative. Bao, who briefly worked in banking before starting his chocolate business in 2015, join forces with the cooperative and a network of farmers striving for better pay. He estimates he has trained 2,000 people, mostly women, in the early stages of chocolate production. He volunteers his time. 60% of the energy of a classic chocolate factory goes into the stage of a roasting, shelling, and I don't have the capacity at home. I have outsourced with these women, so I waste less energy. These women earn something, and everyone is happy. Everyone wins. Bao completes the chocolate making in his Abidjan kitchen. He adds flavorings such as cashew, lemongrass, and ginger. A single bar sells for roughly $5 in Europe and the United States, the chocolatier Ivorian's biggest markets. It's also sold domestically. Now, Bao aims to increase production and to make chocolate more affordable, including for the West Africans who grow it. Most of them are poor. More next step. My next step is to scale up with an industrial unit that will manufacture chocolate. I want an industrial unit which will put chocolate in the local market and in the sub-region and for the whole world. Bao hopes to triple his production and broaden distribution. He wants to sweeten the lives of more Ivorians and others. For Yassine Siao in Abidjan, Ivory Coast, Carol Gunsberg, VOA News. And let's close the show with some sports news. Semalakeng Matebula is South Africa's first black hot air balloon pilot and one of the few women participating in the niche sport, which traditionally has been the domain of the white and privileged. Let's take a look. Semalekeng Matebula is South Africa's first black hot air balloon pilot. Growing up, I had never seen a hot air balloon. Ballooning was not something that was in reach for me. She is now fully licensed and is one of the few women participating in a niche sport, which traditionally has been the domain of the white and privileged. We need hot air to ride, so any tear will affect our ability to retain hot air in the balloon. Matebula got into ballooning by accident, starting off as a marketing assistant for a balloon tour company. When I was introduced to the sport, it was this new and exciting field. And when I found my feet, I realized it goes beyond marketing. And then when the opportunity presented itself by the scholarship with the Department of Sport and Recreation and the Balloon and Airship Federation of South Africa, BAFSA, all the pilots put my name forward and I applied. And here I was being a pilot. Matebula got a scholarship to do her pilot training and earned her license in 2021. She will compete for the first time in the South African Hot Air Balloon Championship in June 2022. In competitive ballooning, pilots use wind and altitude to navigate to fixed targets where they drop a weighted marker. Okay, are you ready? Matebula says that she's keen to be an ambassador for the sport and hopes to bring in more youth and diversity. And thank you so much for watching VOS Red Carpet. My name is Jackson Bungani. For more entertainment news, remember to check us out at voaafrica.com. We are also on all social media platforms, on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube where you can watch our videos. Remember to like, share, and of course, subscribe. Until next time. Goodbye, everyone.